Okay, on Firehouse Tales today, we have two tales that uh, allegedly happened <laughs> that uh, may have gotten me sent in for a, a lecture by the powers to be, and uh, one tale of a lecture that should have happened, but somehow never came about. Okay, one day, uh, according to rumor, there was a uh, large warehouse fire, and uh, the warehouse just burned down. Nothing left, really, just ruins. Well, the fire marshal uh, allegedly wanted to keep possession of the site for investigation, and so he had uh, firefighters stay on scene for uh, legal purposes. As long as uh, we were on scene, as long as there's still a little embers burning here and there, and we have to put it out, he doesn't need any kind of warrant to come and investigate. So uh, this was the next day after the fire, and there were still embers to be put out, remnants of the fire. So they assigned me and an engine company to go there, and uh, this was a hot day. Rumor. And uh, all we had was a very depleted water cooler that didn't have very much water in it, and the water in it was not very refreshing. As the guys putting out the fire all night the night before had drank most of it, and the driver, before we drove away, had not really checked uh, the water cooler. So we didn't have any beverages with us. So I got frustrated and uh, ordered a pizza delivery for myself. And in order to try to keep publicity uh, at a minimum, to try to stay discreet, I had the firefighter walk across the street and get the address of a nearby house that was easily in view of where we were parked. And uh, we used that address for the pizza delivery. And we requested the pizza delivery, of course, bring a couple of two liters of ice cold soda. I thought this was a very good idea. And it took 40 minutes, if I remember. They advised us. They'll be here about 40 minutes. So we're watching uh, the site and uh, talking and chatting trying to uh, get out and walk around every once in a while, a stretch a hose and spray a little water on some smoke here and there. Keep things under control, make sure no, no fire breaks out while we're there, which would be hugely embarrassing. And uh, lo and behold, we kind of forget about the pizza. And after 20 or 30 minutes, suddenly a van drives up right next to our truck. And it's the TV van. And they start setting up tripods and lights. And a very polished reporter gets out with high heel shoes and makeup. And uh, checking herself in the mirror. And uh, checking her microphone, doing microphone tests. And comes over and asks if she can interview us. And I said, no, <laughs> you can't interview us. Uh, we're not allowed to go on uh, make public uh, declarations about a case that's under investigation. However, I can call my captain to the scene and uh, you can uh, talk to him. He can give you a brief rundown on the situation as it's developing. And she agreed to this. And so we called the captain and uh, he came to the scene and he's standing there and the uh, TV camera is focused on him, and they're getting a good backdrop of the ruined warehouse behind us. And uh, the reporter's talking to him, and they're laughing and uh, joking. And suddenly he walks over, and he's chuckling and laughing, and then his smile disappears. And he walks over and grabs hold of my arm through the window and says, Did you guys order pizza? <laughs> pizza had arrived, and we forgot to watch for it. And so they're walking around, and in the middle of his interview, they're asking him, uh, Sir, we've got some pizza and uh, two liters of soda. Uh, this is for you guys. So anyway, that uh, resulted in a, a little bit of a lecture for me. I should have, uh, 
I should have definitely let him know that that was going to happen before I subjected him to the TV interview, and I should probably not have ordered the pizza, as I could have easily just had the utility runner and a pickup truck bring us fresh ice-cold water, or sodas for that matter. Actually, the, the chief was very generous in situations like that, and uh, sometimes would bring us uh, burgers from a restaurant with some sodas. Or the fire marshal, for that matter. Could have done it. So I caused him a good deal of embarrassment on camera, which they did not use in the interview, thank goodness. And uh, he was a little bit upset about that. Okay, lecture number two. <laughs> uh, one time, uh, allegedly, we were coming back from, uh, for some reason, we were on the way over on the west side of town. Uh, they have... Uh, diesel tanks on the west side of town and sometimes we drive the truck over there to fill up at a station on the west side that has the diesel pump and hang out and visit with those guys for a little bit and then drive back and do territory check and I'll surprise the driver with some addresses and see if he can go from the top of his head without uh, consulting his maps and uh, see if he can recite for me where the nearest hydrant is things like that so we're on our way back from the west side of town, and I call up the captain and uh, tell him, uh, hey, captain, uh, is it okay if we stop at the store on the way back? And the captain said, sure, it's a slow day. So I didn't tell him exactly what store we were going to stop at, but uh, me and the driver had been slowly going through the entire list of blizzards by Dairy Queen. If you don't know what a blizzard is, a blizzard is uh, ice cream mixed with uh, smashed up pieces of candy bars. They also use uh, cookie dough or uh, brownie bits, uh, different different kinds. Every, every week, I think it was, maybe it was once a month, I think it was once a month, Dairy Queen would come out with a new flavor of Blizzard. And so we, we always went over to try it. And uh, a lot of our fire trucks didn't have working air conditioning. It's very hot in Texas. It's over 40 degrees routinely uh, centigrade, over 100 degrees routinely Fahrenheit. And we're driving around in a giant fire truck wearing heavy gear uh, with very little ventilation in the truck. Okay, so sometimes ice cream is definitely called for. Okay, <laughs> I never had problems with cholesterol or uh, getting overweight. Although some, some guys I worked with did have trouble with their weight. But me and the driver were going through the uh, menu of Dairy Queen blizzards. And so we stopped at Dairy Queen on the way. And one reason I like to stop at Dairy Queen is this Dairy Queen that was close to our fire station had an alleyway in the back. And we could be very discreet and park the truck in the alleyway. And the alleyway would open up on uh, one of the main streets that led directly back to our fire station. And it was very convenient for us. And if the chief or somebody or from City Hall were driving by, they wouldn't see our truck parked in the parking lot of the Dairy Queen. So we went in the Dairy Queen and we got our blizzards. And uh, my driver surprised me by ordering a banana split. And the banana split is a banana that's cut in half with, uh, I think, three scoops of ice cream and chocolate syrup and all kinds of stuff on it. And it's a little dish. It's not really a cup with a spoon, which is what the blizzard is. It's, it's a whole dish. And my firefighter surprised me by ordering a burger and fries and a giant soda. And I said, he laughed and said, I'm hungry. So, okay, okay. So we had to wait, actually, for his burger to be cooked. So we're standing there for a little bit longer than I felt comfortable with. And suddenly, I hear the tone out on the portable radio. And sure enough, it's a tone out for our station, but it's a gas leak in a residence. And that's not, that doesn't call for our fire engine. That calls for the rescue and the captain. So the rescue truck and the captain are responding. And so I call up the captain uh, using my cell phone and I ask him, hey, captain, did you want us to, to come and help you out? He said, no, no, it's okay. Just, just work your way back to the station. Call on the radio when you're back at the station. And maybe we'll need you. So I was kind of puzzled by that. Why would he need us at a, at a gas leak? Uh, the rescue has the tools to uh, close up the, the broken gas line and so forth. 
And uh, lo and behold, here goes the rescue truck screaming right past the, uh, the street, uh, past the Dairy Queen, and followed uh, a few moments later by the captain's car, zooming by. And I'm standing in the parking lot watching them zoom by. And it's unlikely, I don't think they, they saw our fire truck parked back there in the alleyway, because it's, as I said, it's a little bit tucked in there off the side. And uh, although it's easy for us to exit the alleyway out to that street, they just drove down. Uh, it's a little difficult unless they're specifically looking in that spot at that moment. Uh, they're really not going to see our fire truck parked back there. So uh, I walk back into the Dairy Queen and I tell my firefighter, "Hey, hurry up with your burger, man! Let's uh, let's let's get a move on. Let's go see what they got." So uh, the address is only just a, a few blocks away from the Dairy Queen. So. We pile back in the truck and my driver props up the uh, banana split on the dashboard and he's careful to drive kind of slowly out of the Dairy Queen. There's kind of a bump going out of the parking lot, make sure it doesn't slide around too much. And he has to take a left turn and another bump there and uh, drive up the street and then another left turn. And then he, uh, he parks because the rescue truck and the captain are parked with their lights on and everything far up the street. So we park a little bit short of the scene there, and I'm kind of surprised that there's a lot of smoke in the area there. So uh, I get out, and uh, I'm not going to leave my blizzard in the in the fire truck. We, we, the air conditioning's not working. You know, it's it's going to melt. It's going to be gross. So I get out, and I'm holding my my blizzard, and I'm just eating it as I'm walking I'm walking up to the scene to see what these guys got. And I was going to ask the driver of the uh, rescue truck, who's kind of always he always lingers back stands by the truck, make sure nobody's going to steal anything off the truck. They've got a lot of equipment on the truck, and a lot of guys leave their wallet, you know, their billfold or whatever in, in the truck. And uh, so the driver always stands by. The truck's his responsibility, and sometimes the officer will radio out and, and want specific equipment, maybe a ventilation fan or something, and, and you know, he'll, he'll quickly take it in if, if they want the equipment. So the driver always stands by the truck. So my intention was to walk up and ask the driver what it was that, that was happening. But of course I walk up and who do I bump into but the captain. And the captain turns around and sees me. And then he sees what I'm holding. And then he sees my driver behind me that I didn't realize had gotten out of the truck and followed me carrying his tray of his banana split. And my firefighter behind him munching this gargantuan. Texas sized hamburger that he's holding in his giant meaty hands uh, that's half eaten and he's chewing on it loudly <laughs> and here's the situation the captain had to, to make matters worse okay the neighbor number one house number one has a generator and they like to run their generator once in a while. It's a, like a gas powered generator that you can move around in case there's a power outage. And we live close to the Gulf of Mexico here, so you get hurricanes and whatnot. So uh, people are prepared. Usually a lot of people have generators. So this guy's running his generator and it's producing a lot of black smoke, similar to a lawnmower. And he has the generator propped up in his porch. So all the exhaust and this black smoke is pouring into his neighbor's bedroom window that's open. Okay, and uh, it's afternoon and it's hot and people have their windows open for the ventilation and this guy's just dumping black smoke deliberately into his neighbor's house. And so his neighbor calls the fire department because his house is being filled with smoke and an odor of gas he's complaining. And so my captain and the rescue lieutenant are trying to negotiate between these two neighbors to get them to live peaceably together. And they're both screaming at each other and they're both screaming at my captain. And my captain turns around and there I am walking up with a blizzard ice cream blizzard. And my driver has this huge half eaten banana split and my firefighter is just devouring this gigantic hamburger. But the lecture that I got was and I didn't tell the captain where we were going, and if I had, he would have asked for a blizzard, and it would have really helped him in that situation. So, that was indeed a lecture, but it was a kind of tongue-in-cheek sort of lecture. 
And the third story I have for you was allegedly uh, many, many years ago when uh, they found, I think, if I remember right, uh, but I don't remember right. So all this is just being listed as fiction, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> in order to tell it, all right, I'm just telling the story. Uh, many people involved might remember this completely differently. Okay. But according to my twisted brain, my recollection, they had discovered asbestos in the roof tiles of our station. And they were taking that off and they had to do an environmental cleanup and uh, site survey and all kinds of hazardous sort of stuff. And uh, city risk management was involved and they replaced the roof of our fire station. And we got new uh, insulation also, which was really nice because the AC just never kept up with the heat in the second floor of that fire station. And we had one of the few stations left that had poles. We slept over top of the engine bay. And that dorm up there got hot. And then in the middle of the night, around 3 or 4 in the morning, the AC would catch up and suddenly it would get cold. So we had the worst of both worlds. Plus, the, the train went right by our station. The whole station would shake when the train went by. But they were replacing the roof. And if I remember right, I think it was about maybe a dozen shifts. Maybe it was a month. Maybe it was six weeks. I think I had vacation in the middle of this. So I was gone for a couple of weeks. So maybe I had a dozen shifts at another station. They, they doubled us up. So the engine company got sent to... Uh, the fire station that shared the, the building with the dispatchers. And we also had uh, classrooms there for the police. And there was a separate dorm for an ambulance company. The ambulance was contracted by the city. It wasn't a fire department ambulance. It wasn't the city employees. So we had an ambulance company there. We had uh, a fire engine there. And we had the dispatchers also. So there's a big parking lot, plenty of parking for us. And this was a uh, emergency center that would be activated in times of, let's say, the hurricane is coming. The uh, emergency command center would, would be operated there, which is really a mistake because the station was built a little bit low and you had to have a, a mechanical pump from a pumping station uh, pumping the, the water from the, the engine drains and the shower drains and the toilets and everything had to be mechanically pumped out of that area. And if that pumping station went out, which it did sometimes, all the sewage would back up in the engine bay and you couldn't use any of the toilets. And whenever they had a hurricane warning, I always wrote letters saying we need to get a Johnny on the spot, little portable toilets set up behind the fire station as a precaution. Case we start getting hot water and those pump stations go out, we're not going to be able to use the toilets. But nobody listens. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm distracted there. Okay, so for 12 shifts or so, I'm stationed with my guys, doubling up at the station with these guys. And uh, there's two engine companies now at this one station. Okay, I had problems right off the bat with the firefighter who was at the station because he had a lot of seniority. He was getting ready to retire. He had a long career. He was older than I was, uh, but I was the officer of uh, engine one and uh, he was the firefighter of engine, let's say, uh, engine three. And the officer of engine three was a good friend of mine. We got along really well, but this guy, the firefighter, uh, just didn't want to do the daily routine. He thought that my firefighter, who was kind of a rookie, should do everything. And it wasn't fair for him. He should get a break. And I didn't think that was fair. So we, we kind of were button heads a little bit. And then I discovered that uh, whenever we emptied the trash, the firefighter from Engine 3 would go out to the dumpster in the back of the fire station and he would shake all the trash out of the trash bag and he'd fold up the trash bag and put it in his pocket and he was going to take it home and I had to explain to him that you know 
you can't do that, okay? And I went through his officer, and his officer gave him a little lecture that you can't do that. You can't dump the trash loose because when the fire, when the trash truck comes and empties it, the wind's going to blow it everywhere. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Okay, then another time, I was talking to the officer at Engine 3 there and uh, in the officer's room. And suddenly, a firefighter from Engine 3 comes in, and he's holding these little rocks. And uh, he said, doesn't this rock look like a lion? And look at this one. It looks like a turtle. And uh, the officer from Engine 3 looks at him and looks at me and looks at him and says, uh, I don't want to say his name. I'll say Jim. Jim, have you been out there looking at the rocks for a while to find these animal shapes? <laughs> and Jim's kind of puzzled, and he's looking at the rock, kind of admiring it, and he just sort of walks off. Okay, so that's background. Okay, now here's here's the anecdote I wanted to tell you, so you can appreciate it. The captain comes over, and he decides on a Saturday, Saturday's yard work, he decides, let's dig up all of these plants. We've got these plants that are decorative plants in the front of the station, and they've got these spiky tips on them. I can't remember if the plants are called mother-in-law tongue or uh, agave or what, but they're these big, long leaves, these big, long succulents, and they've got these black, spiky, pointy tips that it really hurt if you bump up against them. And the captain decided that we're going to dig all these up because this is a hazard. And he's backed into them and walked up and bumped into them one time too many. And it hurts. It hurts when you get stabbed by these leaves. And so I'm out there too. I, I like working out in the, in, the, in the heat of the afternoon. And it's a good project and it's a good purpose. And we've got shovels and we're digging up. And I look at my officer of uh, Engine 3, and I realized that I'm out here. My firefighter's out here. The officer of Engine 3 is out here, and the captain's out here. But where's the firefighter from Engine 3? Why isn't he out here? And I mentioned that to the captain. Hey, where's Jim? Why isn't he out here? And the captain looks at me and just waves his hand and shakes his head as if to say, don't, just don't investigate that. Don't look into that. Just let's keep working. And I'm shaking my head like, no, 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 no way. He's going to come out here and he's going to work digging this up. I don't care if he is one month away from his retirement or whatever it was. And I walk into the engine bay and I hear drilling. And I look back. We've got this really nice big metal table that's like a shop table in the corner with all these electro outlets. And this guy has these wooden plates that he shaped and it looks like he's stained them and they're shiny and they're cut really well and they're beveled edges it looks really nice and each one is in the shape of the state of texas and he's got a little stack of them, maybe eight of them stacked up there and he's drilling out a circular hole in the center of each one and he lifts one up and he shows me, and he says, look, I found these clocks, these super cheap clocks. I, I can't remember if it was like $3 or something for each clock, these battery-operated clocks. And they fit in here, just like that. And he sets one into that hole that he just drilled. And he said, doesn't that look nice? I'm going to sell these at the flea market this weekend. And that's what he was doing while we were working out front, digging up these gigantic, painful, <laughs> agave spiky plants. And I'm dirty, and I'm sweaty, and my neck is sunburned. And I'm just shaking my head, and I don't know what to say. <laughs> I just don't know what to say. I can't think. My brain won't work. And I start walking backwards. And I'm shaking my head, and I just don't know what to say. He knows. He has to know that we're right outside the engine bay to the left when you walk outside. And we're working. He has to hear us. He has to know what we're doing. And he's just standing there in the shade making these clocks 
that he's going to sell. <laughs> and it's just, you know, I should have lectured him. And, you know, I, I just, but given the context of all these experiences I've had with the guy, and the fact that he's not my firefighter, he's this other guy's firefighter, and the other guy's a friend of mine, and he's clearly crossed some kind of boundary, and uh, he's going to be gone. It's his last few shifts, you know, and he's going to be retired. He's had a long career, and they're just going to let him go. Just let him go. <laughs> let, him, <laughs> let him look for rocks in the shape of these animals and let him make his clocks <laughs> and <laughs> I was just absolutely dumbstruck and you know the funny thing is you can tell that I like to talk right I just I, I, I can't remember that ever happening to me before as an officer well I hope you enjoyed those tales uh, those are allegedly true uh, some of them might be true and then again, some other people that experienced those same events might tell you a completely different version. And I would probably nod and say, yep, yep, that's, that's probably the way it happened. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, again, uh, my purpose is not to uh, implicate specific people and specific things, but just to convey a general sense of the culture of uh, the firehouse and to try to communicate to you the kind of stories that we share with each other and uh, kind of the way we remember things and uh, firefighting is a very stressful profession and you have to understand that sometimes the stress just kind of pushes people over the edge a little bit and uh, we all have a great affection for each other and we just sometimes let it go. <laughs> well, take care. Hope you have a good day. Thanks for coming along for the ride.